Just a truly incredible scene here. Hans or our team ashore, can you help provide us with a sense of scale? You know, how large are these tubs that we're looking at? Uh, I know that they were jettisoning the, the 20 millimeter anti-aircraft guns. Um, but you can see the catwalk to the left there and the railing. So that gives you some scale on the ladder that drops to that catwalk from the flight deck. And you just see the edge of the elevator in the flight deck in the upper left corner. So that provides some scale for the sailors who would have climbed down that ladder and manned the, the gun positions. Thank you. You can see the catwalk has really dropped and has been, been damaged over time. I couldn't tell you if that was, you know, occurred during the battle or during the descent, but it's clearly starting to drop away. As we start to transit down the port side, you know, it, uh, we'll want to catch the edge, if we can, of the catwalk and look across the deck. So in terms of scale, by the way, you, bear in mind you've got these weapons, these anti-aircraft guns, have a, you know, you have a few guys working them. It's an individual mount, so you've got one person actually, you know, aiming and shooting but you've got other people milling around. So you've got several feet for each one of these gun tubs. The other thing as we move, what you'll see off just uh, on the left-hand side of your screen is a large open bay door for uh, the hangar. And when we get a better look of the deck, the flight deck above, you can actually also see the outline of the edge of the elevator that brought aircraft up from that, that hangar. And this is the, the forward of three elevators that you were going to have. Let me see. So we've drifted over. Looks like we've drifted over it a bit. I'm, uh, I'm going to turn my head 90 to the right and uh, just to get a view of how far we are indeed over it. So I'm going to okay. bring the vehicle around to the uh, same heading that we're moving, which is 215. So we uh, kind of look along it. So, yeah, since I've been sitting here, we've drifted, drifted in just a bit. So yeah, just a bit. We want to be a little more outboard than that. That's a, that's Atlanta on a heading of 215, looking straight down, as you can see from the camera angle up there on the in front of Jacob. seeing in my sonar here two and five would take us out a little so I'm gonna I'm just gonna uh, look out away from the site and uh, square up our sonar there so we can uh, we'll 
then determine which way to step to step away from the site. I'm assuming these, uh, what we're looking at here, are uh, parallel with the with the hull, with the edge of the flight deck, fairly. Fairly. I think so. They might project outboard a little bit, but not much. Yeah. These are all the 20 millimeter positions <coughs> of the anti-aircraft guns that were salvaged. The port side was listing to port, so in an attempt to right the ship. They started salvaging anti-aircraft guns um, from the catwalk. I'm just amazed how cleanly they removed them from the gun tongs. I mean, I'd figure there'd be projections and bolts or something, but it looks like they just were able to cut them right off the base cleanly and get them over the side. Yeah, you can see some yeah. bolt patterns there, maybe. Yeah. Um, from what I'm saying, uh, sorry, excuse me, from what I'm seeing, so we're kind of square up to the hole there. If we do a step of 315, that'll move us away a little. And, uh, uh, yeah, let's try 5 meters 315 and see if that does anything. It's uh, probably going to... I'm going to come up just a few meters while we're waiting for that move. Yeah, I just called in another uh, zero five meters. Uh, so we'll get moving. I'm uh, pinging whatever is below us there at uh, single digits, five meters, seven meters. <coughs> come back around to that 135 heading unless you want to look uh, parallel with the ship there we can look uh, can look parallel in each direction yeah it's nice to look forward but a little bit further outboard and we'll get I think the most information we'll be able to look over the flight deck we'll be able to look along the edge and a little bit down the side yeah, I'm not sure why we drifted in while I was sitting here. Um, sometimes Atlanta has a mind of its own. Oh yeah, well, you know. So you, were you saying you want to be more on the outside or, or going in? A little bit more outboard. All right. And Roger. then we can turn and face the edge of the deck and move towards the stern, move to the right. Yeah, we're we're moving outboard just now, so yep. it's going to take a few minutes for that. Oh yeah. To the the fine tuning on this model is a little bit different. Yeah, and it's going to take me a few minutes to get a hang of how Atalanta moves. Mm -hmm. I'm just amazed the wooden deck is still there. I'd imagine I'm not a expert on marine worms, but I would guess this is beyond the range of the Torito Navalis, the shipworm, which is one of the major predators for wooden ships, wood of all kinds. And I guess the cold and the oxygen content at this depth preserves that Douglas fir. I'm also really intrigued by that, Hans. Like, it's an incredible views at the deck and and yet almost looks you know like there's 
sediment or layers on top, you know, but to know that that is just like a solid wood deck. It does look like soft sediment on the deck, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I'm curious as to the state of that wood. Mm -hmm. One of the little known implications of climate change is the extension of the range of the Torito novalis, the shipworm, which means that for some countries that take pride in their, their underwater heritage and their wooden ships, uh, you know, Norway could be one of them. If those waters warm up enough and the Torito extends its range, their underwater cultural heritage stands to be eaten up. Wow. You're right. That's not a climate change story that I feel like we often hear. Right. I mean, yet another way that we're seeing that just the archaeological and biological, you know, all of these are ways to know about the ocean and all of them are intertwined. Yeah. A good reminder for us here in Papahanaumokuakea, a site of uh, national significance as the largest uh, marine conservation area in America, international recognition, a UNESCO World Heritage Site protected for its uh, nature and cultural significance. Battle of Midway, just part of the story of all of the maritime heritage inside the monument. Really happy to have you with us, Hans, and learning all the time from your expertise. You're going to share a little bit about the, the broader picture beyond the Battle of Midway of heritage in this place? Well, someone, someone wrote, once wrote that uh, the atolls to the northwest are, are just like a, like a sieve, like a comb, straining things out of the Pacific Ocean for hundreds of years. And even the first Western records made of observations from captains back in the day, 1850s, 1860s, noted that there were already things at these uninhabited atolls, like like rafts, like castaway dogs. And so uh, there are stories that we don't know about because there weren't any survivors from those wrecks. But some of the earliest sailors in the Pacific were the whalers from New England and New Bedford. And if they were coming in to refit and to recruit new crew members, because many Pacific Islanders sailed on the Western whalers, they were headed for major whaling populations to the north and to the northwest in pursuit of a lucrative commercial gain, bloodthirsty pursuit of the marine species. And that brought them across low, uncharted, unmarked atolls, sometimes in the middle of the night. So that's another type of historical heritage that Just up another, the monument <coughs> Another five possesses. meters, 315, please, Mia. Oh, thank you for sharing that, Hans. You're welcome. How did you first uh, get into and interested in the field of archaeology? 315. Well, I, I'd have to say I was sitting on a pile of plywood at the job site having lunch and reading an advertisement in the paper for a summer field school. It sounded interesting. I'd never heard of people studying shipwrecks before, so I, I just took the summer opportunity with East Carolina University and learned that this was actually a legitimate pursuit, albeit a, a lesser known one. An incredible story. Great example of taking, taking a chance. Yeah, I don't know if, if uh, you know, my, my, my new wife was so pleased that I'd, one moment I was making real money and the next moment I was a student again, but she stuck, <laughs> she stuck with me, fortunately. Can you share what it was like working on your first um, historical site? Yeah, I, I think I remember a lot of not knowing what I was doing. 
uh, mm -hmm. because it was kind of learning on the job. But we were drawing some of the wooden shipwrecks in Lake Superior in very mm -hmm. cold water. And there's quite some stories to them um, on the lakes. And uh, it was a six week summer field school, learning the methods and then conducting research for Wisconsin Historical Society. But it, it, I, th I think I just caught the histor history bug doing that. And I really like the archeology span and the maritime history as well. Wow. Yeah, like you said, <laughs> cold water. Um, I was wondering, Mike, if you wanted to also share how you got into maritime archeology span and what your first um, historical site visit was like. Uh, let's see, so um, the first site I worked on was in Belize. It was a, it's a Maya site called Mashna. That's uh, one that I've worked at for many years uh, off and on. We were just down there this past May. Um, and so, yeah, my first uh, you know, archeological site uh, was actually on land and in the middle of a jungle. Mm. Um, my fir the first shipwreck site I worked on, would be, uh, I guess in 2006, we, on U University of Rhode Island ship Endeavor in the Black Sea, we found a, um, like a Byzantine age, or a, no, medieval age uh, shipwreck off of uh, Ukraine, off the Crimean Peninsula. Wow. Um, so, that, but I think we, we worked on a couple others off of Ukraine, like a World War One ship that had sunk, stuff like that. Um, that was a pretty cool expedition. That was a couple of years before we got Nautilus, so we were on a different ship. Mm. Wow, yeah, sounds like... Um, ship has changed its heading. There's a lot more still to be known, both on land, like you mentioned, from your first yeah. historical site and sea. Nav, are we waiting for the ship to change heading? No. I was just, uh, we were just noting that the ship has, ship has changed its heading. Okay. Uh, are we in the middle of a ship move? Yeah, I just, I had put in another call and we're just waiting to catch up. Okay, sounds good. Sorry, I yeah, stepped out for a minute. We're moving a little outboard to get that, that angle across the deck again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we still have those gun tubs there where the, the guns were tossed over the side to yeah. attempt to write the list. I mean, I, you know, I, I can't imagine that's, I can imagine that that's, that's something you do is more of a desperation measure yeah. when you're trying so to correct the list of an aircraft carrier. I know. To feel like you're doing some good by throwing some guns overboard, but you try everything you can at the moment, I suppose. Yeah. So Jim had been saying that they, um, they acetylene torched those gaps in the, in the gun tubs. Is that right? Yeah. That's pretty, that's, um, nice clean cuts. They're very clean because they look natural. They look like they were meant to be there. They look sharp. Yeah, they also look sharp. Yeah, this is getting to be a, a good position for us now. It looks like as we get to this last gun tub in this area that we've left uh, the hangar door behind. Yep. I don't think there's another one behind that. Yeah, not till we get to the stern. Yeah. Can you give us some of that context? How far down the ship are we here? Sorry, can you repeat that? Oh, can you just give us that, that Big picture again. How far down the ship are we? Where, you know, where are we looking right now? Oh yeah. So we're um, we're kind of midships, um, but but a little forward. Um, we're we're kind of coming up on where the uh, the 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 stack was, the conning tower, not the conning tower, but the, yeah, the stack of the aircraft carrier was. Um, so there's a hangar deck below here. Step um, another five. And we're kind of at the end of the doors for that. Um, 
And then once we get past the stack, there will be another set of hangar doors. So we're just looking at the deck edge here. These um, these are the gun tubs for some anti-aircraft gun that, that have been jettisoned, so we don't see the guns right now. Yeah, that's midships Bridge forward, nav. port yeah. side, I'd say, yeah. Can we step another Maybe zero five meters, continuing on the 315 bearing? At least a third of the way down. 315. Yeah, we're, s we're still looking straight down on it, so I'm s a little too close to come down anymore. Weren't we moving at 215 before? Yeah, we were. Um, we were just repositioning to be at a better angle. We okay. started drifting in inboard. Oh, okay, yeah. So we wanted to move out a little bit. Okay. But I think we're getting in a good position now. You know, I had studied other topics for quite a while. It's I've, I've, I've had plenty of times to wonder about my choice, but I became an expert <laughs> on on Asian nautical technology, traditional Chinese oh. drugs. And I didn't get interested this much into the World War II resource until I came out to Hawaii and, um, and realized this is what the resource is in Hawaii and in a lot of the Pacific. Yeah. And so, you know, despite how I might have felt in the past, this is a major, you know, uh, resource to study. This is a lot of Pacific history. And it's difficult history. This was a yeah. cataclysmic, terrible event, not just for the navies and the armies, but for the people who lived in the South Pacific and for everyone in Hawaii. It changed the nature of the Hawaiian Islands. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it was complicated. I mean, just when you think about the legit, like, there are obviously these capital ships, like the, the big aircraft carriers and the big battleships and stuff, but um, there are all these support ships and, and just the amount of materials um, people and supplies that had to cross the Pacific and arrive at places and it's just massive, a massive effort. And, uh, you know, we've looked at some oil tanker wrecks and, and some other the um, merchant ships that were part of that, but it's just a, like it really was a full, fully world war. Like it was, it was stuff going on everywhere. Right. Very complex. Right. And every time I read, every time I think I understand even one small aspect about it, I start reading more. I'm just like, I don't really know anything about it. But then, uh, you know, you get a general context and that, that helps uh, understand these sorts of sites. And, and then you get little details like the uh, jettisoning of planes or, or cutting uh, these holes to jettison um, <coughs> aircraft gun. And, yeah. you know, certain things start to make sense. You can see it looks like these gun tubs have dropped. There's another crack in the, yeah. in the catwalk. And yeah, the, um, I'd imagine over time it'll fall away completely, yeah. really. Yeah, there's not much supporting it. No. I'm going to drop down just a bit here and see if I can uh, light it up on the sonar. Yeah, this is a this is a good position outboard, don't you think, Mike? Yeah. Don't quite have a sense on how close I am here. We were saying earlier it's particularly moving to see into the, the normal workaday spaces. Mm -hmm. The work tables, the ladders, yeah, the companionways. Not only does it give us a sense of scale, but it, that's, you know, the sense of, of daily life for what it was to be on an aircraft carrier. Along those lines, Hans or Mike, do you think you could explain, like, maybe how the ship would be organized, like the different levels? Because I have I heard you reference, like, the, um, the hangar and the deck, 
um, the bridge for anyone who's maybe not as familiar with those um, maritime terms. Uh, I'm not sure if this is too big of a question, but could you give like an overview of how the ship is organized? Yeah, I mean, it's, it is difficult without a, a diagram to point to for, for people watching, but basically um, an aircraft carrier is primarily the flight deck. Um, so that's that's the big flat top that, that, that uh, you, you know, everyone, you're very familiar with how, how planes land and take off on that. Um, that's called the flight deck. And um, we're talking about these gun tubs and, and other anti-aircraft gun and stuff, and those are positioned around the, uh, the edge of the flight deck. And then below that is the hangar deck, and that's where spare aircraft and munitions and um, tools for, for maintaining the aircraft and fixing things were. Uh, and they would have these big doors that rolled up, and we're actually looking inside one right now. Um, and that's kind of, that, was, that was a deck that ran the entire length of the ship below the flight deck. And you can see the ladders and companion ways that, that go around that. Mike, excuse me. Mike. Sorry, sorry to interrupt from shore. Can you guys zoom into that hangar, please? Yeah, can we zoom in there? That open space. Yeah. Let's look inside, please. That's good. Stop there, please. Port side. Back it up a little bit, please. Yeah, I'm not seeing aircraft in there. Mike. Yeah, if you uh, give me a minute, I can if come down. Would be, Hans, if there would be one of the things that Russ had noted is that they would have been suspended and hanging from above, but I'm not seeing any evidence of that. But again, with these doors off, this could have been where they were jettisoned jettisoning aircraft. Yeah. Give me a minute. I can uh, drop down a little bit more here and we'll get a better shot inside. Um, when Dan's doing that, Mike or Hans, do you mind, uh, can you say about on the diagram, I'm trying to track with their waypoints and where we are? We're about a third of the way back on the port side, looking across the ship. And we're at the aft edge of the hangar door. So are we about um, kind of almost right across from, there's a couple gauges on that image. What image are you referring to? OK. Uh, so on the top one, do you see the, the hangar door? On the left? Yeah. Towards the bow, we're at the aft end of that. Okay. Roger. Yep, still forward of the of the bridge. This is perfect. This is great. This is our first really good look into the hangar. It's very much appreciated. That's a pretty good look. I'm going to come up just a touch because uh, Atlanta's yeah. lights are looking down. So it's kind of glaring off the uh, bottom edge there. No, that's much appreciated. That's good too. Thank you. Yep. Back up and continue on. Yep. Alrighty. Okay. How far do you want to go? Uh, I think we go back up till we look at the the edge and just catch the top of the flight deck. You want to do that, Mike? Yeah, but uh, do you mean horizontally? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, we can continue doing the same 30 meter moves. Oh, oh yeah. Okay. Hold on. Yeah, we do want to come up okay. again. Roger. Just to make sure there's nothing sticking outboard. Well, Jim, you are dealing with the zero to four watch now, so I'm just, I'm just gonna put it out there. All 
Oh. That's amazing view. There shouldn't be anything projecting off the deck or outboard in theory, but big ships like this often had, you know, boat booms that would swing outboard when they were moored so that the, the boats that came alongside could, could tie up. And yeah, just have it to have a little look around there. Yeah. Sonar is not quite uh, aligning with the 215 move. No, I'm looking at the <coughs> sonar there and trying to uh, square up on it. So the video view seems to be kicked a little from that sonar image. And I'm probably pretty square on it there at one two zero. Shoreside, we have an answer earlier as we were looking at these mounts for anti-aircraft weapons. We could see some deformation and look what looked to be this piece of shrapnel, as well as some mounding or some uplifting from an explosion. And we're right in an area where there was a near miss by a high explosive bomb that uh, exploded close on the surface, caused, quote, fragment damage. Uh, and that's what we're seeing here as we look at this uh, portion. Again, battle damage, which we also saw uh, on the last watch on the other side of the vessel. Yeah. So, Mia, I'm looking one, two, zero, and I'm squared up on it with the sonar. So I'm looking at it, the hole is 90 degrees or perpendicular to Atlantis heading. Atlantis heading is 120. So if we wanted to move perpendicular or parallel down the hole, we would move uh, 210. I think I failed horribly at math, so that's why you're here. <coughs> I failed horribly at math, that's why you're here. 120 plus 90. <clears throat> yep, I'm ready. Sure. Your site again, as you move along here, we're going to start, we're heading from the bow area, moving more towards midships. Yeah. As we get to midships, you're going to be entering an area in which we expect to find some significant damage to the hull, which could include a section of it that has been blown up and protrudes above the flight deck. This is an area where a Japanese torpedo bomber struck Yorktown and inflicted damage during, uh, during the battle. Uh, we are probably 30 or so meters, maybe 40 away from it. 
Right. But we are, we move there, we will be seeing it uh, and at about this level, but also probably closer to the bottom All right. uh, as we get into that position. I'm going to go in and call um, another 30 meters uh, to the bridge. Yep. Andrew. As we're waiting here for this move, maybe I can ask you, Mike and Hans, just to give a like, quick summary of uh, the dive so far uh, for those who might have just joined us. Yeah, so um, uh, we descended uh, over many hours to uh, to the seabed about, uh, or just above the seabed, about 5,100 meters deep. Um, and we came down on the the very top of uh, USS Yorktown uh, at the, the stack. We saw the three openings for the smoke coming out. That was the first glimpse we saw. Uh, we stepped back from that once we um, figured out where we were on the wreck and we came down and moved to the right to, the, to follow the wreck to the bow. Uh, we were on the starboard side or the right side of the ship. Came around the bow um, along the flight deck, so we're looking at the, the edge of the flight deck here. Uh, and now we are looking at some of the damage and, uh, and, and effects of the, um, the crew trying to uh, right the ship while it was sinking um, along the, the catwalk and the deck edge and the anti-aircraft guns above the hangar deck. Um, so we're about, uh, we're, we're, mid, we're nearing midships, uh, but still forward uh, on, the, on the ship, and we're going to so be moving our way uh, the towards the The sonar is our friend now, so I've reduced the range on it to 10-meter um, divisions, so each one of those red circles is 10 meters. And, uh, sorry, I thought it was off SPO. Yeah, thanks, Mike, for that, that summary. Uh, so for those who might know, might have just joined us recently, uh, we are in a very special place of the Pacific, um, almost midway between um, the California and Japan, out in the northwestern Hawaiian Islands, part of the Papahanaumokuakea Marine National Monument. Uh, this is part of our 27-day expedition to explore uh, the deep sea geology, biology, and archaeology of this really wonderful place uh, that is one of the largest marine protected areas on the planet and the biggest one in the United States. And it's a really extraordinary place, uh, almost the size of the Gulf of Mexico, the vast majority of it in deep waters that has never been explored. And so we're, we're getting, over the course of this uh, 27 days at sea, uh, some of the first glimpses at the extraordinary natural and cultural resources of this place. And so I hope you can uh, tune in and join us as we explore the magic of this sacred place.
So again, for anyone tuning in, um, we are currently exploring the U USS Yorktown, and this is really an amazing interdisciplinary, international collaboration. Um, there's many partners involved, both um, on the ship and at shore, um, lots of sources of expertise, all making this happen. So um, just to uh, reintroduce any new, reintroduce to any new viewers, um, could our team from um, uh, assisting us from shore kind of just go around and do some introductions, just so we know uh, who else is um, also online. I might have <laughs> some connection issues. I know sometimes my voice is a little quiet in the microphone. Um, I think uh, Jim is on shore. Um, Jim, if you're on shore, could you let us know? Give us a little shout out. Hi, uh, this is Jim Delgado. I'm the Senior Vice President of Search. All right, country's largest archaeological company, uh, formerly with NOAA, and I'm the lead uh, co-lead scientist ashore. Uh, with me is Phil Hartmeyer. Phil? Yeah, Phil Hartmeyer, uh, marine archaeologist for NOAA Ocean Exploration. Pleasure to be here, and uh, joined by colleague Dr. Alexis Katana. Hello, uh, Alexis. Uh, I uh, head the Navy's underwater archaeology program with an engineering All right, thank you so much. Um, thanks you so much for offering your expertise this on this dive. Um, I know you all have such amazing backgrounds and it would it would fill many hours um, just to talk about um, all the different um, adventures and um, findings you've had. If anyone is interested again in learning more about our team members and the work they've done. Um, you can go to nautiluslive.org and it shows all the profiles of those who are on watch and helping from onshore. Um, then you can click on those profiles to learn more. Uh, could one of our archaeologist team members also just give um, a little overview of what we're looking at? So we've had some questions about if this is the first time we have seen the Yorktown or found the Yorktown um, and just give us a little update about um, the significance like what happened with the Yorktown. I know that's a, a big question but um, some, a little summary if possible. Well at the beginning of the war naval aviation was a fairly new uh, capacity and in fact, the battleships had been planned to be the, the heart of the fleet, and the U.S. aircraft carriers would support the battleships. In truth, naval aviation was a new way to project military power that was more effective. And one of the important aspects about the Battle of Midway this is one of the first times that the battle was fought entirely in the air, with uh -huh. aircraft from launched from aircraft carriers attacking Midway, and carrier to carrier aircraft flying against each other. These surface ships never saw each other in the battle. So the guns you see on them were used to defend them from attacking aircraft. Mm -hmm. And naval aviation would continue to develop. So in terms of that, it's quite significant. Carriers became the real significant capital ship. And after Pearl Harbor, you know, we didn't have many of them. Mm -hmm. Two were sent to Midway, the Enterprise and the Hornet. The Yorktown had been damaged at the Coral Battle of the Coral Sea and was under hasty repairs at Pearl Harbor and ran to catch up um, with the other carriers and fortunately made it in time because the, the number of planes you can launch in the air searching for the enemy fleet and conducting these attacks really mattered. 
Um, so it was really very fortunate. This is not the first time the Yorktown has been seen since she was sunk on June 7th, 1942. In 1998, Bob Ballard discovered the Yorktown uh, with National Geographic and others and conducted a partial survey of the vessel. Back then, as well as now, it's very difficult to reach these ocean depths. Right. And it's not easy, even with, you know, the, the, the best equipment, you need the best weather and, and some luck. And uh, we've experienced those challenges ourselves, but we're very glad to get the Atalanta, which is normally a tow sled, a down sled vehicle, part of a two vehicle system, to get the tow sled down on its own to give us this video imagery. So since then, it's been 25 years where the Yorktown has continued to rest in the dark peacefulness of the deep ocean. And we're able to take a second look this time to see changes uh, from that first survey and to see parts of the ship that maybe weren't recorded in as much detail that we can see again this time. So um, from the point of view of archaeology and history and filling in the details of the last moments of the ship, that's very important. She stayed afloat for quite a while. It's amazing how much damage these ships could take. It's not easy to sink them. And uh, in fact, after given, having been given orders to abandon ship, the Yorktown still didn't sink. So when the destroyer Haman came alongside, a damaged crew was going back on board to continue fighting the flooding and the damage with the hopes of towing the ship back to Pearl Harbor for repairs. The, the priority was to save the Yorktown. That's when the Japanese submarine I-168 fired torpedoes. We think four, we're not sure about the number, um, at the ship's starboard side. She was heeling over to port. The ship was heeling over to port, I'm sorry. And uh, at least one of the torpedoes hit the destroyer Haman. The destroyer sank within four minutes. And unfortunately, on the way down, the torpedoes on board the destroyer, which are midships, and the depth charges, which are aft, uh, exploded. And the explosion of the depth charges claim the lives of many of the sailors who are in the water at that point. It's quite a tragic and horrible event. At least one of the torpedoes struck the bottom of the Yorktown, deep underneath the hull. Since she was, since the vessel was heeling over to port, the Yorktown exposed more of the bottom on the starboard side. And so we think that torpedo damage is very low down on the hull and now buried in the sand. Now, as the vessel is resting on the sea floor, the Yorktown is heeled over, listing to the starboard side, further bearing that damage. So I don't think we're going to have a chance to see the torpedo damage that sank the ship. Mm. And do we know if it has sank in one piece, one continuous piece, or has it broken up into pieces scattered? Yeah, it's, um, it's in one piece. So the the, uh, the torpedo strike did not uh, break it in, in half or anything. Um, it, it it sank in one piece. So we've now kind of circumnavigated the the forward part of the ship. We're back. We're on the other side of the ship, but we're across from the stack. So now we're going to be making our way towards the stern to check out, um, you know, what what condition that side of the ship is in. Right. And could you also give us a sense of scale? So. Um if not like a number, at least like how many um, aircraft could this carrier hold when um, it was still uh, above water? Uh, I think it's too shore, shore side advised yeah. us 90 aircraft. Oh, wow. 90? 90, oh. wow. Design, the Yorktown class carriers initially were designed to ca operate between 80 and 90 aircraft. How many she had aboard at Midway, I don't know, because she just finished the battle at Coral Sea. She lost some of her air group there, and they she was operating with kind of a hodgepodge of um, shore-based units that were uh, 
allocated, you know, at, at a moment's notice. So I'm not sure how many aircraft can comprise the final um, air group. I don't have that information. Sorry. But the carriers themselves were designed to operate between 80 and 90 during their um, operational. And that was similar across across both forces, right? Across both aircraft carriers. Yeah. The, the Japanese also, their carriers, Akagi and Kaga, were also uh, at that point, after their final conversions, were also their, the equal of that. All right. Thank you, short team, for um, chiming in. Feel, feel free to, again, offer any uh, information at any time. Um, and uh, like Hans, you said earlier, that this battle really was in a huge area and you said the ships were not really seeing each other. Um, I have one uh, figure here that the ships were fighting at ranges of 50 to 150 miles apart. So the aircraft were really crucial. I think you mentioned for um, kind of like seeing what was around them and spotting um, other carriers or other planes kind of like scouting as well as doing damage, is that correct? That's right, that's right. I mean, radar was in its infancy. Uh, I don't think the Japanese aircraft carriers had radar. The American carriers had early versions of radar, but these aircraft carriers relied on their scouting vessels, and long range planes. Of course, planes also flew from Midway Atoll. Some of those planes were PBY Catalinas, long range patrol bombers, which were used for scouting and i and i don't mean any disrespect but if anyone's ever played the game battleship it's it's that kind of guessing game you know i mean you you have a limited amount of fuel limited amount of time and you send planes out there to see if they can find the enemy fleet and radio back the position and uh, you know we talked earlier about the fact that yorktown had been bombed, set on fire, went, underwent repairs, got back underway, and was mistaken for another carrier. Right. Um, that's completely understandable, because it's probably hard for us now, in our day and age, with, with uh, electronic advancements and all sorts of information systems to um, feel or, 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 or to grasp how difficult it was for planes in a cloudy no, sky to identify properly ships on the ocean making, you know, fast maneuvers, flank maneuvers at speed, mm -hmm. correctly identify those ships. And even when they attack them, you know, it's hard to tell if a bomb strike was on target or nearby with a huge splash of water. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, it, it takes a while to understand, you know, what were the accurate hits, which ones were recorded, uh, which ones mattered, which one didn't. So yeah. it's completely understandable that, um, you know, that kind of identification was very difficult at the time. Yeah, I think it overall it sounded like information and having accurate information was really critical for this battle. I think both in the scenario you mentioned, but also leading up to it, correct? Um, being, knowing ahead of time, like that um, that Midway was a target. Absolutely, absolutely on the American side and for the Japanese side, not knowing where the American right. carriers yeah. were, not knowing that the code had been broken, not knowing, once they spotted a carrier, not knowing how many other carriers there were. Mm -hmm. That lack of information was, was really crucial. Boy, the, the light structure of this catwalk really is damaged all over. Yeah. You know, whether it's uh, bomb damage or, you know, otherwise, it's just not attached very strongly showing its age. Yep, for sure. Yep. Continuing on 30 meters? Yes, please. Alrighty.
And we have another question, if that's okay, um, uh, regarding aircraft. So because this battle was taking place over such a large area and aircraft are um, relatively small, um, do you think there are any chances of finding aircraft, whether on the carrier or fallen aircraft? Yeah, we were just actually uh, discussing that um, with with some of the, uh, the our colleagues on shore. Um, there were, we think that there were some aircraft, or we know that there were some aircraft uh, that were damaged uh, in the hangar deck. Uh, there's a photo in this book of some of those. Uh, there is a report that they just pulled up that um, that some of those were jettisoned, uh, probably when they were also uh, dropping those aircraft anti-aircraft guns off the side to, to try to lighten the ship. Um, there was a, ver a very small sonar target when we were at the bow that was kind of behind us. Um, it's possible that it's some sort of debris or an aircraft. We might go take a look at it when we come back down this way towards the bow um, and just see if we can take a look and see if it's something of interest. Um, <clears throat> we, there's another hangar deck that we can look into when we get to, uh, further towards the stern. So we'll take a look at that. Uh, that's why we were kind of uh, poking our head, not really, not literally poking our head in, but zooming in uh, when we are at the hangar deck openings uh, before uh, just to see if there's anything in there. So far, not, but there certainly is a possibility uh, that there's there's some pieces or or wreck wreckage of aircraft um, that are that are still in there. Now, Yorktown did roll over, and um, and it kind of also sank by the stern as well. So it was kind of a bit of a chaotic uh, slipping beneath the waves, and obviously it righted itself before it came down through the water column. Um, so I imagine that. Um, if there were any any aircraft in the in the open hangar decks, they may have also slid out. So that's also a possibility, or smashed against the far wall, which we did see on Independence off of San Francisco. Wow. And mm. can I ask what kind of factors affect you know whether, like you said, the um, vessel rolls as it sinks, or if it breaks into pieces, or the orientation? Yeah, I mean that that's going to entirely depend on what the what causes the sinking with the damages so um f for example the uh the U uss lexington that was sunk at uh, the battle of coral sea which is where yorktown was damaged before um before coming to mid or pearl harbor then to midway um the bow and the stern are are, are in set are separated from the wreck uh probably because there were either bomber torpedo hits near there that broke them off and then they they separated in the on the way down um there's other ships like the USS Hammond that sank next to Yorktown that was broken in half because a torpedo hit it right amidships and, and ignited um, some of the, the, the weapons magazines. So it really just depends. Um, the aircraft carriers are, aren't typically going to break in half because like they're just they're big. So um, they're probably going to sink from a couple of torpedo hits that don't go all the way through or break the back of the of the vessel all the way through. Um, there's just so many stories and connected by the flight deck and that sort of thing. So tip of all of the aircraft carrier wrecks I know of, it's only Lexington that has any of the uh, parts of the hull missing, which are the bow and the stern, it, but it didn't break in half. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, if you have a torpedo strike starboard bow, it's going to sink in that direction. If you have a, a strike at the port stern it's going to sink in that direction so it really just depends on where the damage is and where the flooding is all right thank you for that clarification and i'm sorry if i'm asking too many questions if at any point you want to break from questions just let me know um but uh regard some along those lines um i remember you were talking about how the uss yorktown was um, able to control fires, right? So mm -hmm. we have a couple kinds of different damage here, right? We have like fires, we have physical damage from torpedoes or maybe bombs. Um, how how are the ships able to respond to that? Because it sounds like they were able to respond to the fire to some degree, but torpedo damage, is that considered more um, severe? Well, so yeah, so... Um the fire dam fires were caused by the bombs uh, going off. Um, one of them hit uh, the flight deck, which you might take a look at when we get closer to the stern. Um, 
and you know, and that ignites parts of the ship. And 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 all ships, including Nautilus, have uh, extensive firefighting equipment because uh, that's one of the most dangerous things on a ship. Um, and so they were able to. It, it also, aircraft carriers are going to have that near the flight deck because there's tons of aviation fuel all over the place. And if a plane crashes on takeoff or landing, they're going to have to put out that fire. So they have hoses at the ready at all times. Um, torpedo damage is always below the waterline because that's how because torpedoes run underwater and it's it's not causing a fire so much as it's breaking the the hull to let water in so it's a it's designed ex specifically to to sink a ship mm, and torpedoes are coming from um submarines or also um airplanes that are kind of dropping them close both actually yeah both? so okay. yorktown was hit first by an aerial bomb and then an aerial tor torpedo or two and then another set of bombs and then no, i'm sorry i think bombs first then bombs and then aerial torpedoes and then the submarine torpedoes it took a lot to sink it wow and that's after having been damaged by bombs at coral sea and yeah. being quickly repaired at pearl harbor Was this the other hangar deck you're talking about? Uh, I don't think we're quite there. It's going to be uh, past the. Uh, it's going to be quite a ways past the, the stack. Uh, I think these are. Just, I mean, it is. Sorry, it is the hangar deck that goes the whole length. Um, but but there's there's bigger hangar doors um, that are going to be further towards the stern. So what we're at right now is another roll-up door. Russ Matthews just you know, spotted it and pinged it in. Uh, that leads gives access into the hangar deck. Yeah, so thanks. So if we can yeah. uh, pop down and look in there, that would be awesome for on these spaces as we yeah, move along. I think that's what Dan's trying to do. Awesome. Great minds think alike. I think we're right across on the port side from the air operations just after the bridge and from the forward part of the tripod mast. Yeah, so can you? Um, so as we look in there, you see that object inside? I know we're bouncing a bit. Uh, so, uh, uh, which window are you looking in? Right, left, or middle? The smaller, the smaller one. The, the smaller, smaller one, one in the okay. middle. Yep. You uh, see that thing? There? Towards the bottom? Yes. Yep. When we get an opportunity, we can zoom in on that. Yeah, can we zoom in on that when you guys have a chance? There we go. Ugh. Oh wait, there's something in the back. When we go down there, it's hard to make out.
So we're liking this a, a great deal. We're liking it a lot. This is making us really happy. Okay, that's good to hear. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Can we? What's in the back? No, no. Go ahead, Jim. No, you see that thing hanging there? Yeah. Uh, uh, up Never. like near the ceiling, right? Yeah. Can we yeah. can we lower ourselves at all anymore? We're looking for planes, obviously. Yeah. Just saying. It's really hard to see in there. No, I know. I know. We're we're very much all here in awe yeah. uh, of the fact that this is being done. But there is something. There's something back there. Yeah. So close. Did you see that, Alexa? Yes, 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 yes. (laughs) If we can tilt up a little bit, we might see further with the roll. That's the furthest. Roger. Are we looking at beams in the overhead? Yeah, it looks like that. The the cross beams from the from the flight deck. Yeah. Roger. I'm amazed that you know what look like paint cans can still be sitting there. Yeah. This thing fell five thousand one hundred meters. Yeah. And there are paint cans sitting there. One of the most powerful things as we do these types of explorations is it's one thing to observe one of these shipwrecks from the outside. We don't always get looks on the inside, particularly in spaces like this hangar, which was an incredible scene of action and service and sacrifice during that battle. The thought of these guys down there getting these planes ready, uh, getting them up onto the deck damage control happening as Yorktown is hit. I mean, these looks inside the ship give us a very different perspective than the obvious perspective we get by looking at Yorktown externally. Again, so much of what we look at, even though there's some evidence of the ravages of time, are frozen moments in history. I think we can zoom out and continue forward. Yeah, can we come full wide? Oh, we are. Yeah. Yeah. Mia, are we in the middle of a move? A little close. Yeah, shipboard, we've been sort of deliberating over some of the varying levels of damage to the catwalks and some of the lighter, um, you know, walking surfaces and just thinking perhaps maybe an impact or as your town was moving through the water column, that pressure that was basically uplifting and potentially buckling um, these lighter supported walkways, catwalks lighter metal surfaces seem to be a little bit more mangled generally than some of the heavier structure. Yeah, Hans and I were talking about the same thing a little while ago. It's, um, I think I think it probably is uh, from moving through the water because they're really not attached very strongly. Right, right, right. 
Ja, hey. Back row. I hear you. Right. I have a question for the back row, actually. I'm not sure if it was answered already, but uh, what do you think the rate of descent was when the carrier went um, fully went under? Uh, we, yeah, we tried to uh, think that through uh, earlier. It, it's kind of hard to say, um, but I think um, probably faster than we might think. It, I mean, it wasn't like terminal velocity, but it um, it probably sank quite quickly. I do think that the flight deck itself acted as a bit of a parachute and kind of like, um, you know, entrained water as it came down. So it wasn't quite as streamlined as other ships. But we do know that it buried itself uh, the, by the bow into the, into the sediment. Thank you. I was surprised to realize that the, the apparently the ascent rate or descent rate of the of Hercules is about the old style scuba ascent rate before they changed oh, yeah. it. Sixty feet per minute. I think about it's thirty feet per minute. Oh, thirty. Now. Yeah. I think it used to be sixty. Oh, okay. Just gonna drop back down again now that we're safe distance away from the wall there. And for those watching as we move along, um, we might we say ask the ship to move, but it takes a long time for Atalanta to move as well since we're uh, connected via a long cable. So we have to have lots of patience as we step forward. Um, especially when we're trying to see into these small views. Patience is not one of my virtues. Yeah, same. Mia, are we in the middle of a ship move? Uh, no, I think we, uh, I think we should, if the ship is stopped, I think Atalanta is just about settled. Okay, we, I mean, we don't need to really wait if we're going to just keep moving, so we, we could, um, get, Ad we could keep Atalanta moving if, if you want. Right, sequentially. Just yeah, it's up to you if you want to look into, peer into these uh, hangar doorways or keep us moving. Yeah, I'd like to keep us moving. Yep, we can keep moving. Uh, two and five this time. Oh, uh, yeah, three, zero. Is that an airplane wing back there or am I dreaming? Uh, Dan was just asking if that's an air, airplane wing. Don't, don't tease us, Dan. I think uh, we looked in here, didn't we? Yeah. We yeah we that, no, it's just the back side of the uh, the hangar. All right. Bridge nav, can we step three zero meters on a bearing of two one five? So, this is Shoreside. I was talking with Russ Matthews, who's joined us and has not able to not able to call in. He points out that this area that we're looking into right now is most likely one of, and uh, it's in an area that features in an iconic image of the, during the battle in which a uh, Grumman F4F Wildcat uh, and uh, other aircraft are in this spot, uh, having been damaged. One of them's hanging upside down after the bombing attack, uh, and that one of the aircraft in there had already shot down three uh, Japanese planes, when Torpedo Squadron 3 had to uh, sortied against the Japanese First Carrier Striking Force. Uh, that plane had flipped over on landing. The pilot was uninjured. And uh, in its overturned condition, uh, it was shown and photographed, most likely in this space. So again, what we find 
for the first time in some cases as the lights illuminate something in this seem you know eternal darkness are these moments these places that live on in historic photographs in black and white and now we see them three-dimensionally and in the, the color that comes through with the light down there at the bottom of the sea a reminder that there are these incredible monuments to the past the best and the worst of the past sitting down there that exploration like this gives us access Yeah, if I heard you correctly, um, that is definitely one of the goals of this exploration mission is to really assess the archaeological condition so that we can inform protection and preservation of these historical sites and monuments. Uh, could uh, someone on the archaeological team also help explain maybe like what kind of aircraft were involved? So I heard the name of one of the types of aircraft, I believe, Wildcats, right? Um, and I believe they played a pretty significant role and some of them maybe were uh, maybe more new or certain pilots were maybe more trained. Could you explain the different kinds of aircraft involved? A standard aircraft carrier's air group at the time would have consisted of a um, mix of aircraft types. They would have had uh, bombers, torpedo planes, um, fighters, and scout planes. Uh, and you know, they were pretty much used for what they, you know, what their names are. I mean, uh, the um, the fighter at the time was um, the, as the, so it was the F4F Wildcat, I believe. The torpedo planes were the TVD uh, uh, Avengers. Is that what they were called? Devastator. 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 They were um, by, by the time of Midway, they were grossly obsolete and and outclassed by their Japanese um, counterparts. Um, they were slow, cumbersome aircraft, and they were literally slaughtered in their attack on the, um, on when they uh, attacked the Japanese carriers. The, dive, the bombers were the SVD Dauntless dive bombers, um, very iconic uh, from this battle. To, to break in for a quick second, uh, Nautilus, you are at the, Location, Alexis just spotted. You're at the location where Japanese aerial torpedoes struck and damaged Yorktown. If you can start to drop, we're looking for evidence of that torpedo hit uh, inside of, of the carrier here. In Dr. Ballard's book, it shows open hull and damage below this level. Uh, we'd like to see if we can verify that. Yeah, uh, can, sure. if we're going to do that, you, we have to stop a ship. The ship's got two meters left in the moon, so. Okay, we can drop down after that. Hey, I do that, sure. We'll uh, drop it down till it hurts. And to just to finish the aircraft question, the fighters were um, used for to cover the um, the air attack, cover the torpedo planes and the bombers, as well as to provide what they call combat air patrol um, over the over the carriers to provide defense. Um, and it was uh, that was a the Japanese used a similar type of setup. They had a range of uh, aircraft types for specialized missions as well. And when our Dive bombers kept over the Japanese carriers. The uh, Japanese fighters were at lower levels um, after they had engaged the torpedo planes and had not returned to their combat altitude. And 
so they kind of cleared the way for our bombers. Did you say which level the damage would be on? Near the top, the middle? Lower, 15 feet below water line. 15 feet below water line. Below the water line, 15 feet below the water line. But just a feet to the left, probably lower. Yeah, probably a bit to the left, just said a bit to the left of where we're looking now. Okay. And down. The aircraft as well, I would be remiss, I said this earlier, but my wife's uncle, Leonard Ewald, was a devastated pilot with Torpedo 5 on the Yorktown. He was not here for the Battle of Midway, and uh, that's because he participated in the Battle of Coral Sea and was shot down in the skies uh, there uh, in the early phases of the battle. He and his radio men survived, were rescued by Coast, Coast Watcher Martin Clemens, Guadalcanal, and transported safely through enemy lines, covered in swans and canoes, getting onto a Copra schooner and ultimately getting a destroyer back to Pearl Harbor, where uh, my wife's uncle showed up, uh, reported in, and then went home to his very pregnant wife to tell her that indeed he had survived. So he was not on his ship at the time, but he flew in off of this deck, knew these guys well, and fought in one of these aircraft Leonard went on to have a long and distinguished career in the Navy, for which the family is eternally grateful. Uh, he's no longer with us. It's, of course, many of this great generation are gone. But I know that my wife is one of many Americans who have family members who served in this conflict, as we also have friends and colleagues in Japan who have family members, some of whom are still with us, who also served and fought in this conflict. And in assessing this past and in looking at this history and these reminders of it, again, may we never uh, face such a, a disaster as a global war again. Noting, of course, that we are, of course, a world in which war still does happen and that war is going on in Ukraine right now. Jim, I thought that the, um, the, tur the aerial torpedoes that struck on the ports, that I thought those were more towards the bow, and it was the... Uh, the submarine hit that was near the stack on the starboard side. We're looking right now at the after action report. Alexis just handed it to me. And what it shows is uh, aircraft torpedo explosion at frame 92, about 15 feet below waterline. Gallery walkway blown up by geyser from torpedo explosion. Uh, aircraft torpedo explosion at frame 80, about 15 feet also below the water line. So we should be in this area. If you go a little more to the left, unfortunately, I think we may have gone past it. But the very famous photograph of the ship getting re sinking and that piece of structure sticking up, Mike, yeah. that, that's from this, this I think we've, we've likely missed it, but yeah, we're we going to come back come back along the mud line, we should encounter it. Yeah, that, that's or the plan. Or it's buried. Yeah, I mean, maybe just buried. That's the mud line there, and uh, let's look in uh, 045. Yeah, we can, uh, can we come back up to the, the flight deck and and put in another, once you're there, put in another 30 meter move. Roger. Roger. Jim, we'll come back along the uh, the mud line to, to look for damage. Uh, thank you. It's much appreciated.
I'm ready. Bridge nav, can we step another three zero meters, continuing uh, bearing two one five? And to everyone who's just tuning in and joining us now, we are looking at um, the USS Yorktown. That was a part of um, the 1942 Battle of Midway. Um, this was a pivotal naval battle that really changed the course of World War II in the Pacific. And um, as part of our exploration, we really would like to honor the stories and keep alive the memory of service and sacrifice made by Japanese and American servicemen and really illustrate the importance of protecting this cultural heritage. This battle did result in the loss of over 3,400 sailors and airmen and hundreds of aircraft were also lost. Uh, it took over, uh, it was fought over a large expansive area, 50 to 150 miles apart and we are currently exploring in extremely deep waters. Um, this level of um, exploration is pretty difficult, or really at the limits of what uh, remotely operated vehicles can explore at, um, just due to the pressure. Um, so we are going to continue exploring. We have uh, been going up the side of the ship, and I believe over it a little bit, and um, we will continue exploring this for the next few hours. Um, we do have a question, if uh, someone from the archaeological team can take that question. Um, what is the process like to, you know, find a wreck in such a huge amount of area? Um, is there mapping first involved? Like what kind of um, surveys go into that? Yeah, so um, we were fortunate that uh, in order to, to work on this wreck. It was actually found in 1998 uh, by Dr. Ballard, who uh, is the, the, the lead for, for Nautilus. Um, so we, we knew where it was. We did do a mapping uh, run with our, our uh, multi-beam sonar this morning, and we, we acquired a target, which is kind of amazing because we're using a, a sonar that's mounted to a ship at the surface. It's not deployed uh, underwater. Uh, so it's at the surface and we're able to to detect a target, even as big as an aircraft carrier, when you're looking at 5,100 meters below the surface, um, that's actually quite, I was actually very surprised to see it come up in the in the sonar. Can I interrupt um, you for a second, uh, Mike? Do you yep. want me to continue on? Yep. Yep, you Roger, know, that, that was after our 30 meters already? Uh, no, but um, once we get down to 10, it's easier for the bridge to keep going. Yep, that sounds good. Um, but anyway, to, to, to find a wreck like this for the first time, if it was not um, previously known, um, the, the best way to do that these days is to use a, a deep water AUV or autonomous underwater vehicle, uh, which you can send down to certain depths, conduct a, a grid pattern survey, and then come back with the data, and then you review that, and then you can send an ROV down on targets as you find. <coughs> Yeah, Thank for you for that clarification. Sure. For regular viewers, um, you'll also know we're not diving with our, our standard complement of a dual ROV system. Um, we're diving deeper than our 
beloved ROV Hercules can take us, um, here being over 5,000 meters beneath the surface. So, uh, plans to use um, two other ROVs from our team, Little Hercules and Atalanta, uh, but Little Hercules was not ready to do the dives after we had discovered some um, issues that were not fixable at sea. So, um, really proud of the team coming together to launch uh, and prepare a dive plan that could be dope um, outside of our normal, you know, entering this place, still continuing to uh, seek all we can learn from it, um, honor this place, both as Papa Hanamu Kuakea, the ancestral realm and sacred realm of uh, Kanako Iwi, the native Hawaiian people, and also as a testament and tribute to uh, the events of the Battle of Midway that happened here. Just a small note for those who uh, were listening earlier and um, are not familiar with metric units. Uh, 5,100 meters is approximately 16,732 feet. So again, we are extremely deep. Yeah, it's over three miles or 51 football fields. the same. Do you want to zoom on it? Is this the ladder that's twisted or is it part of the the walkway? It could be a rope ladder. So, yeah, ship board is the ladder. I think it's just a, a mangled metal ladder. Hmm. Incredible to think about the forces twisting that up. Yeah. If we were in shallow water, the system would be somewhat akin to a drop cam where we yeah. simply lower a camera down and mm -hmm. the ship moves around and the camera sees what it sees. So Atalanta, the vehicle Atalanta has thrusters that give it the ability to change its orientation and turn, but it's hanging at the end of 5,100 meters hey, of cable. Uh, Hans, can I interrupt you for a second? Yes. Um, do you want uh, us to continue on 3-0? Yes. All right, thank you. Sequentially. I'm popping down. Who's driving this boat, Mike or Hans? The answer is Mike. Yeah, and it's worth noting, you know, the 20 millimeter anti-aircraft guns are, are present. Alexis is noting there there should be four of them. We see two here coming to you now. Right. So these uh these gun tubs have these guns are still there, and the tubs were not uh, cut. So that's interesting. They must not have gotten to these. Right. Absolutely wild. Could you explain to folks who weren't watching earlier what uh, what the change in that? What did we see on the other tubs? So yeah, so the um, the gun tubs on the on this side of the the vessel, the port side, about forward near the bow, um, there were sections of the of the plating cut away uh, with acetylene torches, and then those guns were um, jettisoned over the side to try to help right the ship um, when it was listing to port after the uh, the torpedo attack. What do they, uh, what did one of those guns weigh that they were jettisoning? Well, that's a good question. I don't know what they weigh. It be significantly heavy to go through the effort of... Yeah.
Uh, yeah. Uh, everybody, this is awesome. The, we're getting a really good view of those 20 millimeter anti-aircraft guns. If at all possible, every time we see an open door, we would love to look in it as well, too, please. Um, yeah, we, yeah, if, yeah, we can do that. So do you want me to ask the ship to stop, Dan? Let, let's, uh, let's just look at the next one. If we can see, if we can see it, um, okay. I just think it's amazing that they were trying to write the listing aircraft carrier by jettisoning the guns. But I've just looked up the um, Orlikon 20 millimeter cannon, and apparently, if we can believe this page, loaded with 200 rounds, you're looking at 400 pounds per 20 millimeter Orlikon cannon gun. All that effort represented so much hope, you know, at a certain point in the battle, it was thought that Yorktown may be able to be towed and returned back. Um, so uh, back to the U.S. for repairs after the battle. Ultimately, that did not end up as her fate as she's here in the, or as it is here in the uh, final resting place. Well, we're looking on the left uh, of the screen here, cabins that were used to lower small boats that were stored in the, in the hangar space behind. It's interesting to note that um, naval tradition at the time, and still even true today, um, each ship was uh, allocated a number of small boats for you know, taking the crew ashore for liberty. The captain had his own private launch, and the uh, admiral, if the, ship, if the ship had embarked a flag officer, also had his own what they call barge. Yeah, I don't know if we can get close enough with those gun tubs above us. Understood, Mike. We really do appreciate the look. I mean, I know we'll be coming back, but we'll be looking at different things. So thank you. Plus, just saying, if you look in that window and there's an aircraft in there, then you all get the gold star. Aim to please. Such Thanks an incredible to opportunity to, make to be here and bring demerit. people from all over the world to honor this place. Every glimpse is sharing new information with us. New information, whether that is a reflection right. on what has changed in 25 yeah. years. Look at that. You can see. See the block at the end of the crane? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. See the hook. Oh, yeah, so that's a crane there. For the boats. Yeah, for, or very, very, for the, the davit for the boat. So would all these boats be tucked inside, and or would they have been lined up? kind of along the side under the... Megan, you're very quiet. Can you move your mm. mic any closer? Sure, how's there that? There we go, that's better, yeah. Awesome. Would the boats have been inside or along? No, you can see around? um just below the davit, there's like a platform there. They, they were um, they were stored there.
cast of that. It's just it's like a, opening. It's a massive uh, opening up okay. to the largest one. Is that by the right. elevator? Uh, it makes sense why they'd have that heavy crane there. Yeah. So this big opening we're coming up to is going is the biggest opening we'll have to look in towards the uh into yeah. the hangar. Yeah, we'll give that a shot, Jim. Nick can uh call in another move if you want. Yeah. Oh, yeah we'll see it as we go by. When yeah, we can look in slow. as we're going. Uh, the two one five, yeah, three zero two one five. I have a question back row. So, how deep do you think um, the carrier is sitting under the mud line? Hey, uh, yeah, quite a bit actually. Um, so when we looked at the bow. Um, it was buried like up to the anchor. We, we could see the anchor, but so it's quite a bit, uh, quite a bit above the waterline is, is buried in the, in the mud. We'll see when we get to the stern, um, how much is, but yeah, it's, it, it, uh, uh, hit pretty hard and buried itself in there. And how tall was the, uh, is the carrier? Uh, that's a good question. 20 meters, um, we're... 20 meters altitude right here. Yeah. It's oh, yeah, way. okay. Do I remember the draft being about 30 feet? Does that sound right? Yeah. And if the draft's about 30 feet, it was at least another 30 feet to the anchor. Yeah. Well, it's, so list, it's a lot. listed over, so. Also that, yeah. I don't know yeah. if that's an accurate number, but our altitude right now is average 20 meters. So yeah, if we could get a peek in that hangar, that would be great. And drop down just a little here and see if we can light it up in there. So another question for our archaeology team. Um, when you're looking at this and uh, determining what we're looking at, you're probably uh, referencing a library of knowledge, right? So do you have, like, have you looked at maps, um, photographs? How do you prepare to know what uh, the differences are between the current state of the ship is and what it used to look like? Well, we have a whole bunch of uh, books on board. Um, the 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 most useful thing is always the ship's plans. So we're scrolling along as we go by to identify, you know, what the ship was constructed like so that we can kind of attribute what the wreck looks like now to how it was designed. Looks pretty empty in there, huh? It does. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Coming up. Sorry to disappoint. Is that Look a gun up there? That's a big gun. Yeah. That's a five. Even five if it's empty. I think so. Yep. Yeah. There'll be two of them. Should be two of them. Uh, until there's not, because the last time we thought there were going to be two, just one was missing. Yeah. Just not there. Just going to uh, come up and look down a little bit more to get some better lighting. Yeah, we're, there. we have these two gun tubs, and then we're pretty much at the stern. Yeah. Making good time, relatively. We 
station, I would have tilted the lights up just a bit more. I was concerned uh, uh, if I did that, it would uh, blow out the camera. I'm too much light right facing at the camera as we're looking down. Do you guys know the artillery that these cannons were um, yeah, equipped these, with? Yeah, these were uh, five-inch shells. And we, there's a um, smaller anti-aircraft gun that have um, four barrels in a row. Those are 1.1 1 .1 inch. Yep. Yep. 75 caliber. Yeah. These are anti-aircraft guns. Are these the same guns that you said were um, jettisoned? On the other side? There was one that was jettisoned. One was missing, yeah. Uh, but no, the, the, it was the smaller ones that were primarily jettisoned. These were, these would have taken some effort to move. Yeah. So five inch shell for any aircraft? Yep. Yep. Wow. Five inch 38 caliber anti-aircraft gun. Jim, do you, do you know which, uh, which guns were the ones firing flak? I'm trying to remember what a five, what a five inch with uh, the proximity. I, yeah, I, yeah. When I think of, I think it's about for twenty. Uh, yeah, just any any of these aircraft guns are firing, you know, would be considered flag. Yeah, if the, when the shell detonates, it's going to send shrapnel. Okay. Yeah. In the air. That's what you're seeing, like in the most recent Midway movie. Yeah. But the proximity piece has not yet been introduced. That's so right. You didn't okay. have that capability. So, yeah. But you could still set a fuse and fire it, and it would go off. <laughs> it's just the proximity fuse was a game changer. Russ is pointing out that the shielding on the gun tubs appears to be cut away. Were they getting ready to jettison these? Incredible to see that. Yeah, Russ, that Russ range. Matthews just pointed out that the shielding in front of these guns looks to have been cut away, which suggests, again, you know, on this side of the ship, they were trying to get rid of as much weight to correct yeah. the list from the aerial torpedo they may, attack. They may have been intending to jettison them, and then they found they're too heavy. <laughs> well, and you just got to wonder how long would it take, right, to, to clear one of these out given yeah. Yorktown was progressively lifting further and further to right. But so, someone was really efficient with their acetylene torch. And good at it. Look and at really good at it. Um, looks like we're approaching the stern here, so we'll just let, uh, we'll hold here till uh, Atlanta kind of settles in, and then we'll yeah, we've got a little little ways further. What I'd like to do is if we can kind of pirouette around the back of the stern, take a look at that, and then drop down, take a look at the stern by the mud line. Um, and then the the next step of the dive is we're, I want to go back along this side, the port side, along the mud line and do an inspection for damage there. I think there should be more stern. Yeah. It's going to uh, drop down a bit here and see if I can uh, get a bit of a better return on the uh, sonar. There's a target off there to the uh, to our starboard as well. I'm not sure if that's a debris or a ghost. Find out when I drop down here. There it is. There's more stern. Yeah. There's 
still should overhang to the right. Yeah, I wonder if it broke off. That could be, that's over there. It looks like the t that back of the flight deck broke off. Yeah, not seeing it yet. That should be right there. Yeah. I hope we get yeah. a clear right yeah. yeah. They know is that a T on the back of the stern? Can you repeat that? I think it. I think I might see letters on the back. You should see the ship's name. Man, Mike, remember on Independence, yeah. we walked right up, and it's nice. Yeah. Yeah. So if you can sit yeah. there when we swing yeah. around. Can we zoom here? That. Yep, go ahead. You can see the five. Yes. It's five. Yes. CB five. Yeah. Mike, you remember seeing remember seeing the battleship number for the Nevada? Yeah. The first time the robot got yep. down on? Yeah. There's, Frank just spotted the five. You see it there? In white paint? It's just white, right? Yeah, in white yeah, paint. White. Yeah. Wow, right in the center of the screen there. Yep. I don't see it. I mean, it's very clear in New York town, but it's always nice when you see, you know, a vessel's mm. name or number. What an incredible moment. Just... See that white street to the left of the pond? It could be like a crack. It could be a crack or it could just be some corrosion project or something that's mm. run down the hall. Yeah, I think the end of that flight deck broke off. Yeah, it seems like the end of the very end of the flight deck is no longer there. Yeah, did you hear that? You hear what Frank just said? No. That was evident in Ballard's uh, survey indicated that part of the aft end of the flight deck was missing. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, there you that go. Bullseye. That's a good target to aim for because somewhere around that bullseye below that, yeah. we should be your town if it's there. But there's a lot of corrosion and stuff there. Or mud. Mm -hmm. I was almost expecting the stern to be a little higher off of the seafloor based on how buried the bow is. Maybe it's all buried as well. Mm -hmm. All right, try. so, yeah, if we can come back, basically we want to do the same thing, but go in the other direction and just stay kind of on the mud line so we can see if there's any damage from the sinking or from the torpedoes as we go mm -hmm. uh, and, any, and and potentially any debris adjacent to the wreck. Do you want to look uh, closer at the stern here? Oh, if we can, yeah. Picture of it, you can see it in some of the uh, corrosion let's do back in 98, uh, but we don't know. 10 meters, 105. 
second again, just to update our new viewers who are joining in from around the world, from very um, various countries. We are looking at the American aircraft carrier USS Yorktown um, that was uh, that participated in the Battle of Midway. Uh, this um, particular carrier is about 824 feet long or 251 meters. Uh, it's very, very deep at around uh, 5,000 meters deep or about three miles. And in the Battle of Midway, two rounds of attacks from Japanese aircraft uh, caused um, the this ship to develop a list. Um, and while it was under tow in a salvage attempt, uh, it was further attacked and on June 6th, a Japanese submarine fired some torpedoes, which struck the Yorktown and another vessel as well. And on the morning of June 7th, the ship sank. Uh, it carried 141 officers and crew. So we are here to explore this um, shipwreck. And in our exploration, we would like to make sure that we really honor the uh, sacrifices that were made here and uh, our work here is really highlighting um, our interdisciplinary and interinstitutional collaboration moving 